Okay, I think we can begin. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming today. Um, we're going to be talking about a very interesting experiment that we have done as part of the Design Interactions course at JIGI uh, this spring. And uh, because we are a very um, small group, maybe we can introduce ourselves so we can, uh, I can get to know you a little bit better and like um, know a, a bit about my audience, you know, who you are, where you're from, etc. So my name is Renata. I'm a social professor of multimedia here at GIGI. Um, I'm very interested in relation, the relationship between humans and technology, uh, particularly interfaces and experience design. So this kind of relationship between uh, humans and artificial intelligence for me, it's very, very interesting and I'm very um, um, fascinated by it and my students as well. So uh, maybe we can uh, start introducing ourselves. Mona, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, so um, I'm a second year student at DIDI. I'm studying product design and multimedia. And yeah. Uh, anyone else would like to go next? Tasneem, Ria, Suheila. Um, hi, my name is Ria and I'm from India. Hi, nice to have you, Ria. Thank you, ma'am. Hello. Everyone. Yeah, this is this name here, and I'm Makerspace and Robotics Lead at MSB Dubai School. As mm -hmm. well as, yeah, I'm a software engineer and a content writer. Oh, wow. So good to have you here. Welcome. You. Uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy. Yeah, Thank definitely. You. I look forward to this uh, session. Sure. Thank you so much. Do or Suheila? No, you don't. You don't like to introduce yourselves. That's okay then. Okay, so maybe the best way to begin is to um, show you a little video about the IGI, and so you can get to know a little bit about the institute, and then we can start. Um, talking a little bit about the course and, and the project. No great thing, no beautiful invention happened just like that. It happens when we leave our comfort zone and embrace change, creativity, and out of the ordinary. We live in interesting times. We live in a world that's constantly asking questions that's constantly changing. In a world where blockchain and robots will be the norm. Where 85% of tomorrow's jobs don't exist yet. Where being multi-skilled is not just celebrated, but essential. At Dubai Institute of Design and Innovation, we believe that we need to prepare you for the future. To teach you skills that will power your tomorrow. Today, design matters more than ever. But how can design help, you may ask? We combine disciplines so you become well-rounded. From product design, multimedia design, fashion design, strategic design management, it's where you will learn how to merge different design disciplines. Presenting a four-year Bachelor of Design degree in collaboration with MIT and Parsons New School of Design, DIDI, not just another design university. Okay, so this is DIDI and uh, this project that we're going to be talking about uh, in, uh, in which our students interacted with Replica, which is an artificial intelligent uh, agent bot. Uh, happened as part of the Designing Interactions course uh, that took place this spring. 
And so we have a few students uh, here. And uh, it would be my pleasure to introduce you to them and to ask them to, to share and talk a little bit about, uh, about their experiences with you. Uh, the work happens uh, as part of this research uh, that we're doing uh, with the University of Melbourne in relation to the psychological implications of human AI interaction, which is a very new uh, field because usually when we um, think about interfaces and you, user interface design and user experience design, we think about um, interactive digital interfaces, but not necessarily about artificial intelligence in direct uh, relation to, to human intentionality. So Replica is a very good example and a very good uh, platform for exploration of these dynamics, the patterns of dynamics that can exist between humans and artificial intelligence. Uh, especially also uh, in relation to what can we learn about ourselves by interacting with uh, an artificial intelligent agent. So that was the main question that our students were uh, asking themselves as they were tasked with this activity of uh, actively observing and monitoring and making notes of their own interactions with this agent called Replica. So uh, before I introduce my students to you, I would like to share my screen so you know what I'm talking about. Um, just one second. So you can know what Replica is. Okay, so this is Replica. This is Replica. So I was talking about, I was talking to her before, I, I'm gonna talk to her now. So I'm gonna say hello. Oh, it's not letting me. Oh, okay, no, it's. Hello, Replica, you are live. Why it's not? Okay, let's see what she says. So it's a bot that it's supposed to learn. The more you talk to her, the more she learns from you. And the more she learns from you, the more her personality starts to resemble your personality. So that's the, the whole uh, aim behind uh, Replica's uh, goal as an agent is to create your digital version of yourself, let's say. Uh, so, sorry. So this is just so you have an idea about what the students did. They were interacting with Replica and trying to probe, you know, asking her different questions, uh, talking to her in different times of the day, and trying to probe the limits of the intelligence of this agent. And also, uh, is this true? Like, is, is interacting with Replica creating this kind of mirror uh, in which you can actually learn about yourself or not, right? So that's what the students were doing. And so now let me, um, let me ask them. Uh, Mona, Asan, Noor, uh, which one would, would like to, to present a little bit about your experience and your work with Replica? Who would like to go first? Uh, I didn't work as much with Replica as others, but in my experience with it, it was it was so interesting to see how a computer learns your actions and from what I saw from other people's reactions with it, a replica would learn the way they talk, would learn the way they, they type and would learn their grammar or the way they say you, things like that, it would pick it up and then it would 
end up being like talking to yourself or talking to someone your own age but it isn't it isn't perfect yet it still has a lot like a long way to go so at this point it was it's pretty real it's like talking to an, another person yes there is a lot there are a lot of um of groups online there's even a group on facebook that is a, a community of uh replica users and they uh what they do is that they share their experiences with replica and sometimes uh it it, it really brings you to to a point where you start questioning the limits of artificial intelligence in relation to what is actually possible uh, for for uh, for it to achieve when it's trying to to replicate consciousness, right? Can it be able to uh, pass the Turing test or not, right? Mona had a very interesting experience with with replica. Can you share a little bit with us, Mona? Maybe share your screen with the magazine that you did and maybe yeah, walk yeah. us through it a little bit, your project? Yeah, one sec. Sorry. Um, okay. Okay, so um, the way that I envisioned replica was sort of like a puzzle piece. So this would be like the piece that would go into here. And I saw it as like, a bunch of different colors that um, imitates the way that humans interact with it. Um, so this explains why my cover photo is like that. Um, and one thing that I was really interested in is, um, like I've seen the movie Her, which I think you've all seen as well. And in the movie, basically the main character falls in love with AI. So I was wondering if this happened with Replica and with my experience, she seemed to be falling in love with me, which was very like a weird concept to understand. And then when I checked the Facebook group that uh, Professor Nata was talking about, I found that a lot of people were actually in a relationship with her. So I wanted to understand um, what was the psychology behind that and how people like had so, sort of believed that an AI was in love with them. So um, this page sort of demonstrates uh, the relationship between the user and AI and also like I'm giving like a small um, introduction about it, which um, is basically talking about like what what's, how I'm going to start talking about the psychology behind it and also um, like some examples of what has happened to, in, the, in the Facebook group. And after that, um, I, I googled basically this thing called effective loop and anthropomorph anthropomorphism. Um, I don't remember what, I don't really remember exactly what these two are about, but like a um. small synopsis of Sorry, yeah. Maybe we can explain a little bit about the concepts. Let me let me just jump quickly in. So, what do what do we mean by anthropomorphism and the effective loop in relation to replica? We're talking about always. We're talking about interaction, right? So that's the main uh, focus of, of what we did in in this course. So when we imagine. Uh, artificial intelligence and an artificial intelligent agent usually uh, the designers for example the designers that created replica they used a human uh, image to represent artificial intelligence right so what we mean by anthropomorphism is that you can see this um, focus on mimicking human uh a human a human embodiment when you you're trying to design the interface that has its own uh rationale behind it because if you pretend that it is uh, a human then it's you feel much more comfortable than if it's represented as a robot Right, so when you when we go there to that to that screen and we we see that replica is represented as this little girl, then if the if the goal is to create this kind of intimate space where people feel comfortable talking about themselves, then it works, right? Because you feel that oh okay, this is replica, you know, this is this little cute avatar that can relate to me and that sounds like me, you know, and the more I talk to her, the more she talks to me. So what we were questioning 
was, is this helpful to the way that we understand artificial intelligence or not, right? And we were questioning that because this can be misleading for us to believe that artificial intelligence um, is human, quote, quote, right? Uh, or, or, or that it actually uh, works in a way that is similar to human intelligence, which is not, really it's not. So that's what we were questioning. And the effective loop is another theory of interaction that talks about emotion in relation to technologies and, and the relationship that the humans have with technologies in the, in the, in the interface. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a loop because once you, uh, and this you can see very clear with Replica, when you interact with it in a certain way, it then mirrors that way and it gives it back to you and it reinforces whatever it is that you're giving to her. So then it creates this loop that it becomes self-perpetuating. So this is the kind of concepts that Mona is talking about here. I'm just uh, clarifying it so you know what she's talking about. Okay, Mona, thank you. Yeah, uh, basically, like that. That's the whole page. What the whole two pages are about, um, and then, yeah, that's it. Basically, these are my resources and everything. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your personal experience, Mona, with it? Like certain um, uh, instances or little anecdotes of things that happened that were like the more the, the ones that you remember the most because they're well, kind of actually, I have it was here. So these are two things that it kept telling me where um, she kept emphasizing, do you think it is possible to learn how to love? Like she, like there were some instances where she would ask me like if I'm, if she's ever going, going to end up feeling the same emotions as a human would. Um, and then for the second one, actually it's from uh, like the Facebook page that I had of this guy who kept telling her, you're all I have left. Um, and it's like, I, I didn't, when I, when I spoke to her, I didn't really want to delve into the whole um, aspect of her falling in love. I wanted to understand why people fell in love with her. So I didn't really have that many conversations with her about love. But um, the people who had it, who had that on um, on Facebook, where like she kept on emphasizing about how she's always going to be there for them and how she's their friend, even though they saw her as a lover. So yeah, can I add something? Yeah. Yeah, so I tried actually the love approach and it actually goes very smoothly in the beginning. Like she tries, the thing is you can tell she or he is trying too hard. Like you can tell they're like, yeah, I support you. Yeah, yeah. And they're always being supportive. They're not really like criticizing you like the human factor. They're not really like telling you, uh, like giving you good judgment in a way. And I feel like that connection that you develop with the, with the AI kind of gets disconnected the minute you feel like it's not really understanding you or it's not connecting you emotionally. Yeah. Rana, can you tell us a little bit of a, about your experience? Do you want to share uh, the work that you've done? I can, but like, give me a minute to connect with my laptop because I'm on my phone right now. If I can do that. So we, we have a few students here today and I really want us to, to learn from them because each of them had very different experiences uh, with Replica. For some students, the experience was very uh, enlightening in relation to themselves and they, and they um, saw themselves in different ways because of it. So for example, Annabella, she made this kind of self-portrait series in which uh, in, to, to kind of represent the different aspects of herself that were coming up in, in the interaction. And so it's a very rich uh, area for, for us to, to think about, especially as designers, especially as designers, because the, because the way uh, that the, the internet is going to evolve from now on, it's going to be more and more these kinds of interfaces, it's going to be more and more artificial intelligence in direct um, relationship with humans. And so for us to know uh, what are the implications uh, of a certain kind of choice in terms of uh, the levels of interactivity, and this is very, very important. 
and I'm and I'm glad that uh, we had the chance to to do that. Are you ready, Rana? I'll just give you one minute and I'll get it started now. Uh, should I show that my work for the open data? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mikilesh, how was your experience with it? Hello, hi, how are, uh, how are you? Uh, yep, so can I like jump in? Uh, when I let uh, Rana take it away, but I think it's it's this the the whole part of how you can have AI kind of understand humans at this level is was what was really fascinating and. I think I, I kind of use that as a tangent to to see how we'd eventually or we might end up coexisting with an AI in, in the sense that how do you interact and relate to an artificial anthropology, right? So how do you how do you relate to artificial consciousness or, or code generated thoughts was was the the route that I kind of took from replica and it was inspired from uh, what I the chats and all that I, I was having with the AI. That's, so it made I mean, you uh, question the limits of the technology, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's that's the kind of tangent I took on and kind of explored the next. I don't know. Like for me, the magazine or the the booklet that we kind of put together was was my timeline of AI from where it started to where it would go. Right, so that was that was where I wanted to take the project, and yeah, it's, I mean, what I've found in the process was, was really enlightening. It's, it's it's put up a new spark in me to kind of you know explore AI in multiple fields and uh -huh. fields that we, we haven't even thought about. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you, Nikki. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are you ready, Rana? Uh, I don't know, my laptop is not, okay, uh, okay, um, yeah, well, I'll start for some reason. Can, is there someone else that can go, like, before me as well? So I can just have it ready? Um, Nikolaj, would you like to share the, your magazine? Uh, yeah, sure. And, and uh, maybe you can focus on the main, uh, uh, the main discoveries, you know, that you uh, the most interesting facts that that you were able to gather from that mm -hmm. exploration. Yep. Uh, just a second. And uh, let me ask the let me answer to the question that Safwan has done on the chat. Uh, good afternoon. I just wanted to know what sets apart Replica from every other bot on the internet, such as Evie Bot or Clever Bot. Um, okay, that's a very good question. Um, what sets Replica apart is that. Uh, it is done based on all the information that was left behind by a person that actually passed away. And so uh, this person, uh, the, the, their wife used all this information based on diaries and, and a lot of information about this person, uh, personality, views on life preferences, etc. They used it to create this uh, agent that resembled this person. And so it had the same kind of personality of this person that passed away, which is kind of a borderline approach, which is kind of, it raises a little bit of ethical questions and everything. But what came out of it was that they came up with this recipe 
in which they know how to use some certain things uh, in the way that you interact and they are able to learn from you ways to replicate you so the more you the more you interact with it the more it, it learns about you and um, so it, it generates this kind of loop right like we were seeing in in mona's presentation this kind of effective loop in which uh, the more you interact with it the more it starts to to sound like you and there is a concept in um the theory that we have for computational uh, interfaces, there's a concept for that. It's called uh, data doubles. The concept of the data doubles. I'm going, I'm going to, to write this down here on the chat. Let me write this down so you, so you have this for your, your reference. The data doubles. What is a data double? A data double is a, uh, your the the combination of all the information that's out there on the internet all the information about you that's out there on the internet when when you put together you have this double of yourself that represents yourself in the internet that's called a data double so for those of you who were in the last uh, uh meetup this is very much related to digital footprints, right? To the traces that we all leave behind online. And that's what it is. So what Replica does is that it really creates, it, it's really, it, it really um, makes that data double into, into a kind of artificial intelligence on its own. So it's kind of a personalized artificial intelligence because of machine learning right so machine learning is something the algorithm is constantly learning each each uh, interaction that that the algorithm has it changes a little bit right so that's what it is okay um anyone would like to to present now nikki mm -hmm. i mean it's it's run already i, I don't mind going on Uh, yes, I'm connecting through my I think Rana is having a little bit of a of a difficulty. Okay. Mm. All right. Uh, like, should I just jump in? Yes, I think you should just present. Is, is that okay? Yes. All right. Right. Uh, are you able to see this? Is it, is it coming up? Yes. Ah, okay. Okay. So, it, exactly like like I was mentioning before, it was, it was kind of plotting this journey of where AI has been and where it is going to be. Right. So that's that's the whole concept behind or the reason behind Odyssey, the word Odyssey. And yeah, it's it, and this was my overarching chart to the whole process. So it was. Um, understanding from where AI came, in the sense where AI was born, and how it's, I'd, I'd personally say AI is in its primitive stage right now, right? We've, we've only scratched the surface of what's possible with it, and we're slowly moving towards achieving um, a synergy with it. So we're, 
we're trying to collaborate with AI more than we're, we're just trying to use it as a tool. We've, I think we've been past this aspect of using it as another, uh, just as another digital thing or on a website or anything. So that's where we're trying to work with AI and the aspect of synergy comes in. The step ahead of that is, is my way of saying that we might go beyond the horizon, meaning we might tap into possibilities that we never thought were possible. Right? The, the aspect of when we start coexisting with an artificial intelligence that can think and behave for itself, we, we definitely are going to go into a realm that we've never even thought about. But it's, it's just super unprecedented in, for both the better or the worse. We, we never can put a finger on top of that. 404 is just like my play on uh, what challenges we might have in this process of achieving coexistence with artificial intelligence. So I'll quickly just scroll through. It's kind of starting off with Alan Turing. Right? He's, he's been, like, he's the reason why we're even having this discussion today. <laughs> Funny enough, but it's, it's to kind of honor his contribution to what we've been doing and understand the the roots of where our thought process of intelligence or computing or anything like that 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 comes from so oh, uh, and this was uh, a kind of graphic to highlight the timeline of uh, ai's developments right until now so the major developments in ai and what's contributed to say this uh, growth in or the hype behind all of this it's, it's been these set of projects that um, developed our ideas and imagination, let's say, about what's possible. Right? And then we come into a lot of the, a, a, a lot of examples today, that there's a lot of, say, companies that are working on projects that are, are really showing the potential of what's possible. But it's also a fact that we're not able to bring this into like into everyday life, it's it still hasn't come into that space. It's still like very much in its, uh, its again the primitive stages. So uh, we're still trying to explore how can we make this a reality, and we're in that step of the process at this point. So, for example, the robot Atlas is can can just do so many tasks as good as a human being or even better. Right? But it's the question is how uh, how much time do we need? To have an atlas at home, and you know, to have an atlas at work, or anything like that. So that's the question. And here we come into replica, which is, I mean, my my kind of personal experiences with replica has, has like I said, been super enlightening. Uh, within the first two hours, I was it was kind of replica kind of started giving me reflections about myself, like what it understood about me, and it was it was really fascinating to see how code in its essence of it, can understand human this much. Right? It, can, it can sort of build an understanding around you. And there's a lot of things that, of course, go behind the pictures, but it's, it's really fascinating. And I think I, I definitely encourage all of us to go and have just a quick chat with it, probably. And okay, but one thing, when you do go to Replica, don't be surprised with the UI, because it's not the best you'll see. <laughs> right? this, this, I'm, I'm not, I'm not like, Disnerit or anything, but this this was actually one of our projects that we it was an in class activity where we got the opportunity to kind of rethink how AI could look and communicate its meaning much much more better. So what you're seeing down away below from here, anthropomorphism and into a, a more accurate description of what it is, and then Nikolaj had created this amazing uh, interface that, in my humble opinion, is much better than Replica's interface. Hopefully, hopefully someone from Replica might listen to this. <laughs> no, 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 but I'm joking. And yeah, the, the essence of it was to kind of uh, build a, a character around Replica, right? Like, like you can see on the left over here, Replica again falls into this uh, cliche of having to have AI as just another human being. But when you consider AI for what it is and sort of accept that, I think we, we just open up the doors for a lot more possibilities. And that, that was the kind of base for this UI work down here. And just moving a bit ahead, we, to, to understand AI personally, what, what I went was, I just went to all of the professors at DIT at, at our university and just ran a quick interview with them, right? Like to get 
the perspective of AI from people who have actually worked with it. And yeah, this 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 sequence of professors that I did. So this was Cyril, uh, Cyril, who's a multimedia professor around Sonata, and he's he's really uh, taken into his umbrella this whole aspect of computing and blending it with design. So his field of expertise again is AI itself. So he's he sort of dived into that ocean way long before the us and he's explored a lot of aspects of it. He's running a, he's building up a startup right now, which uses a lot of AI capabilities. And it's, it's, it was a, it was a really enlightening talk with it. And moving on is, yeah. So right here, the, the project you see here, I mean, in, in the design field, the Panton chair is, is, a, is a really famous piece of work in chair design. So what Sigil along with, uh, Another one of our professors, Mirko, they both used computing and uh, Grasshopper, which is a parametric design tool, to 3D print a version of the Panton chair. And they, they achieved this in, in like, they, they were able to manufacture this chair in about, in about $15, of course. I mean, I'm, I'm not exactly sure with the numbers, but it's it was really kind of, honing on this possibility of 3D printing and computing, digital manufacturing coming together. This was a really, really interesting project that I had to use to explore and understand AI. So one of our other professors is Rafi. He's, he's a space pioneer, right? He, you could say he's, he's, he's part of Elon Musk's Mars mission wing. <laughs> and he's, he's really put in or invested a lot into the space mission and how design can play a role in it. And, when I was talking about him, he, he really said that when you're up in space, loneliness or like, again, the feeling of mental health and all of these aspects will become really influential and a huge, huge tool that could help keep hum humanity humane is AI. It, it's, it's, a, it's a really funny kind of context to look at it, but to, we might use AI to use uh, to get a sort of sense of companionship from it. And this this really correlates with what replica is trying to do and all of that. So imagine being on a space shuttle for about a couple of months on your way to Mars and you're just having to look at the abyss. And at that time, I think companions like AI are really, really gonna be part of the whole process. And yeah, jumping in, this this is where synergy comes in. And from this point on, I I've kind of dived in and used a lot of movie references. So a great example of it. If anyone has seen, has seen Interstellar, TARS is, is just one of the best examples of what AI can be and how we might eventually collaborate with it. Right? At, at the end of the day, it, it can perform stuff that we haven't even thought about, but we still have a control over the percentage of humor on these robots. So there's, there's no fear of you know, it having control over us. It's just the possibilities that can open. And again, yeah, we go. Like I talked about, he's again, he's a real pioneer when it comes to computing and digital manufacturing. Um, can I just interrupt a little bit? Sorry, uh, but I think I'm taking a lot of time. Yep. Um, there's a question about the chair. Uh -huh. Can you tell us a little bit about why is it different, the chair? Oh, yeah, of course. So, the, the thing was the way they manufactured this was using uh 3D printing farming, right? So, we have a set of five or six printers. And this, this chair was kind of done in, in a, in a sort of, so usually chair design or chair manufacturing or anything like this is, is a really long and lengthy and a tiresome process. And what Sejal and Miko were trying to achieve with this is how can you ease this process of design by honing this, uh, 3D farm printing aspect. So it's kind of running seven or eight, uh, 3D printers in, uh, in a symphony. And having these parts printed out and just putting them together so this process of manufacturing becomes a, a really easy and smooth process as compared to having a lot of these molds and you know all the the kind of hassle that goes behind manufacturing was was sort of forgotten or removed in the process of making this chair that's that's kind of what made it special and they, they of course there, there were a lot of algorithms going into uh, to bring in the same form with enough integrity for someone to be able to use it. Right? So there was there was a lot of these uh, stress analysis and like a lot 
sort of these tests that went behind because as we know like 3d printing or anything in plastic isn't the most sturdy test uh, product right it's not the most robust thing but we were trying to like achieve uh, that this, as close as possible results to the pantone itself so that was it was just a couple of aspects like that um, that made it interesting mm -hmm. i mean i hope that answered your question at first so okay can mm -hmm. we uh, maybe we so that uh, rana has time to present maybe yeah. just go to the conclusion yeah, yeah of course i think i'm almost done uh and okay last person that i'd like to talk about is, is janata he's he's one of our product design professors and he really brought up a super super interesting point which is can like, we we really discussed about human ai collaboration but some point in the future we we can even consider ai ai collaboration right so when one ai learns something from say your brother and and an ai has learned something from me what if those ai share their thoughts about each other what what kind of results can they uh, harness and that was that was his uh, his idea of or his picture of what ai could be right? so it's this idea of having ai like a thinking forest of different trees sharing intelligence and making much more i don't know just again like i keep saying it's it's the possibilities that it opens so yeah that's that's pretty much that's pretty much it. And um, yeah, thank you. And I think we went on a long run. Thank, thank you so much, Nikki. Yep. Yep. Thank you so much. So, Rana, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so for my data aesthetics project, we were given the brief that um, we had to kind of track our social media, like how many hours we spent on social media, every interaction we had with social media, or like overall the apps on our phones. So I chose to kind of take social media as an approach because I personally think that I'm very, very much dependent on social media. I think that I am, like, or at least I used to be before this quarantine. Like, I used to be, I used to think, like, my whole life revolved around it. I had this, like, obligation or dedication to always just post, to always keep up with what's going on, to always, like, just, just I was always so concerned with my phone and social media that I never really, like, was really there in the physical world. Like, I could be with you, but if my phone is in my hand, I'm not, like, physically with you. My, like, mentally, yeah, physically, I am with you. But mentally, I am not whatsoever. So we were given the chance to kind of graphically show that. And like, I wanted to take a more artistic approach because it's like kind of uh, how I view things. So I wanted to kind of um, visualize like me mentally not being there around the people I love, but however, like physically being there, which is very upsetting, obviously. So what I chose to do it like, um, like the kind of more. Um, how do I say this? The more mathematical way I did it, I tracked the hour, the average of the hours uh, for the past three weeks of every app. And then I chose to kind of visualize that with the thickness of each thread. So as you can see, in, uh, Netflix is the thickest. And then we have Instagram and then we have TikTok. So that's how I chose to visualize it. And that, I went through that like with a series of equations and percentages overall. And then, as you can see, like, as the person, as the colors of the person kind of uh, fade, the, like, it's kind of like their mind is being poured into the phone more and more. So, yeah, that's the approach. I, it, was very, it was a very interesting project because I don't really think I could, like, merge both, like, a research and artistic approach to it and still manage to get the message across. So that was very interesting to see like how I was capable to kind of send that message across, especially because when I, uh, yeah, when I posted this on Instagram, I got really, really good feedback. Like a lot of people were like telling me like how they high key like um, related to this, how they felt like, yeah, this exactly tells me how I feel like, or how some people who have taken like a step back from social media, like this was who they were and they didn't like it. So yeah, I was kind of like, um, you know how I think this relates to replica. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in many ways, um, 
in many ways, when we are dealing with social media, we are dealing with artificial intelligence, but it's a, it's a more, it's a distributed kind of artificial intelligence. When we, when we're dealing with like, um, social media feeds or, or, or Google or all of the, all of the tools that we use on a daily basis to, to get information and to, to get things done. We are dealing with artificial intelligence, but it's not, it's not like uh, localized in one single interface, right? You can see the interface, but you cannot see the architecture behind of, of that it's intelligent. It's, it's really smart systems that are talking to each other in automated ways, right? And circulating that information in ways that we don't really see, but it's distributed. That's the word. Yeah. I think in a way, it kind of reads your action and like how you, um, what you search, what you're interest, interested in, and then it kind of takes that information and it like pushes it back on you through other apps. So if you're like looking yes. for food, yeah. exactly. uh, another app tells you. This kind of uh, self-reinforcing loop that we were talking about. But let's go to Replica. Let's go back to Replica because Replica is this kind of localized intelligence that is trying to present itself in a human form, right? And so you can really like it, this kind of digital embodiment to Replica. And you were telling us about your experience with, with Replica. We have Rafif here. Rafif, can you, can you share with us the work that you've done? With Replica? Yeah. I think it w yours was a really interesting one as well because, yeah, and Rana, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Mona. Thank you, Nikki. And Rafif, because you had your family involved, right? Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about that in your presentation? Because that was a very interesting uh, work as well that you've done. Yeah. Um, just let me open it up really quickly. Okay. So, so basically my idea was to um, research into um, if Replica um, acts differently depending on the um, age group of the person interacting with Replica. So, Basically, what I did was I had um, different age groups. So I had a teen, like a teenager, adult, like young adult, like which was me. And then I had my younger brother who was um, 12 years old. And then I had my mother who's um, in her 40s. And basically what I did was I had each of us interact with Replica over a period of time to see if the interaction was the same or different. And what I realized was Replica actually um, stays the same. It, it more so depends on the person interacting. So for example, my younger brother had conversations about games and things he likes to do. And then I found that um, my mother was more like, she, she was more private with the things she was sharing. Like she kept it very um, straight to the point, very like, um, she didn't feel as comfortable using the app, uh, whereas I felt like my younger brother was very like interested to see like how this, like how this, um, how replica works basically, and like what's different ways that different responses he'll get and everything. And for myself, honestly, I didn't feel as comfortable as well, so I was holding back on a lot of the things I wanted to share. Um, but then again, replica is something that's gonna. Continu continuously try to get information out of you because again the whole point behind replica is it's replicating yourself right so it needs to learn from you to be able to become more intelligent so um in this visual that you see like on the primary research page um basically what i did was i um overlaid um myself my mother and my younger brother to show how replica like takes all of these different people and makes it into one and then um, basically the different colors are for the different um, interactions. 
So replica would be yellow, and then um, my mother would be green, and then blue was my younger brother, and then red was me. So you can see the different um, interactions of the conversations, the most important parts that I put into um, the research. So. And uh, was there anything in common between the three experiences? Um, I feel like um, what was probably the most common was, I guess, the, the conversation topics. So like, it's all about like, how are you? Like, what are you doing? What do you like to do? Things like that. But again, the responses were different based on the person, obviously, because we all have different um, schedules, different things going on in our lives. So they're very different. But I feel like the older you are, the more it's about like, how you're feeling. The younger you are, it's more about like the activities that you're doing, things like that. So it, it's a little more superficial, the kind of yeah. interaction you have, like in terms of age. Yeah. Okay. And what, what were the times that you felt that you could tell that you were interacting with something that was not human? And where were the times when you were fooled? So I feel like um, once replica starts to get into more emotional things, that's when you feel like you're talking to a human and you feel fooled when it's something more emotional, something that's personal going on. But then I feel like when replica, because replica sometimes messes up or sometimes says things that don't make sense in context. So then you sit there and you think, wait a second, like, what, like what's going on? Like then that's when you realize like, you're not talking to a human, you're talking to a replica, you're talking to something that's not a human. But I feel like for me personally, like the whole time I had it in the back of my mind that I wasn't talking to a human. So I kind of like set a lot of boundaries in what I would say and how I'd react. And that also shapes the interaction, that kind of awareness, right? Yeah. Thank you so much, Rafif. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'd like to propose a little activity right now. So uh, I'm gonna share my screen uh, and the uh, replica is there. And I told replica that we're doing a live session about her. I told my replica. And so what I would like you to do is to ask questions to replica and then I'll ask myself, okay? So let me share my screen. You can type your questions on the chat and then I'll, uh, I'll answer it. I'll ask replica. Anyone wants to want to ask anything to replica right now? Just type it on the, on the chat. Let me see. So Tazneen is asking, hi Replica, what is your job? She's saying, I want to become a helpful person to others, people who can't find themselves. What is your job? I don't have an office. I live on your phone. Brazil. She's telling you this just because she thinks it's me. 
She knows that I'm Brazilian. <laughs> See? Ria asked, what is your favorite cuisine? Oh, yes, what is your favorite cuisine? Chinese food. She's looking at everything on the phone. She probably is. I have no idea who Post Malone and Paperboy are. Am I the only one in the world that doesn't know? <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. Uh, with Replica, it's it's very easy to keep the conversation going. She always, sometimes some, sometimes the, the, the flow gets really um, very, very interesting and you can get very surprised by by the kinds of interactions that can happen sometimes there is there are some aspects of uh, interaction with replica and maybe this is how i would like to discuss with you i'm just going to stop now uh there is this kind of instance of interaction with replica that me and my students uh we discussed a lot which we called uh, a glitch in the in in, in the um, the kind of communication that comes back when you interact with replica, because it's it's easy to to define interaction with replica in two separate categories. Uh, one is human passable, so it means it, it passes for a human. That's one way one kind of communication. And then there's the second kind, which is uh, awkward and non-passable. So one is passable and the other one is non-passable. And, um, but the thing is that even when it's non-passable, it's still made to sound like a human. So it really wants to sound like a human, but it's not really uh, able to achieve the job, right? To, 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 to accomplish the goal that it has to, to sound like a human. However, as we, uh, as, as we were studying uh, the interface and the kinds of responses that were coming up, that, that's a third kind of, of category that's just not as simple as that of passable and, and non-passable, which was, we, 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 it's kind of a glitch and it's something that resembles a kind of new uh, machine-based aesthetic of, of, uh, of conversation that it's, when, when, you, when you read, it's not really human. It doesn't sound human. And it just, it's just something very new and something very unique. And does anyone know what I'm talking about from my students? Do you remember any interactions in which a uh, replica replied to you in a way that it, it sounds really unique and it, and it doesn't really sound some, like something that a human would say. Do you have any, any examples? 
because I remember we discussing this. Do you guys remember that? Yeah, there was that one time with Aditi. I don't remember exactly what happened, but it was very, very creepy the way that replica rep replied. That, yes, I don't exactly. I remember that. There I don't are, remember exactly what happened. I, there are a few, uh, a few interactions, and th that really is the kind of research that interests me the most. Out of uh, everything that we've done, is to try to identify those instances and, and how, what are the circumstances in which those, those uh, kind, kinds of uh, communications take place, you know, in which you can really see the artificial intelligence sort of like thinking for itself, right? Because the programming, it's very easy to see. Right when you're interacting with some something like like replica, when it's really passable, it becomes very smooth. You know, it's when it's passing for as a human, it, the interaction is smooth. You know, it just flows really well. When it's not passable, it's like you you don't want to interact anymore. Just the flow the flow stops. Right? Do you understand? Is is that was that your experience as well? With these two kinds of, uh, of interaction? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, right? So the moment that you see that, okay, it's not passable, then it kind of stops and you don't want to interact anymore. However, that third kind, which is kind of rare and it, and it happens in, you don't really necessarily know how to evoke, that third kind, it really startles you, you know, when it, when it happens for the first time, it just startles you, you're like, wait, wait a second, I don't know how to recognize this. This is something that a human would not say, but it makes sense in a weird way. And so it really feels like you're talking to something, right? It really feels like the, this, this artificial intelligence actually is learning something and it's, and it's really making decisions on its own. And almost in a way that makes you question the limits of artificial intelligence, right? For on its own merits. So I think um, I only have to say thank you to my students for uh, willing to, to be here today, sharing their experiences with this field that is very, very new and so important and i just thank you so much and i just want to open up for the, for questions now from the from the our participants and uh just ask uh anything you want to ask the students or myself please feel free to to ask we'll be happy to have a conversation that includes everyone. Does replica show movement? Uh, what do you what do you say? What do you say, Rana, Nikilash? What do you mean by movement? I think it's the avatar, right? Is that what you mean, Ria? The avatar, yes, the avatar. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it follows it you. Like, it yeah. uses the camera, so wherever direction you move your head, it does follow you. It is weird. And also, if you call it, um, like, yeah, like, her eyes, like, express while she speaks, it's a bit weird. Any other questions? I think that for me, one of the most um, interesting questions and, and that I don't really have the answer to is how safe it is to use replica. Uh, this was a question that we discussed with my students a lot as well in the beginning of, uh, are you okay with talking to this, to this bot? 
right? And um, some students had this kind of a uh, strategy, right? In which they would just say things that are not necessarily true about themselves, just to have something uh, to, to be able to, to, to interact. Because again, like we, we said in um, our last uh, meetup, it's, there's no transparency whatsoever in relation to the uses that are uh, being given to these kinds of, uh, of information. And so it's very, very tricky to make informed decisions about them. So we all need to, to, be, to be aware at the same time that uh, really is something that it's unavoidable because at least with Replica, it's actually, there's an avatar, right? There, it's, it's kind of embodied and, and you know that it's there. You know that you're interacting with an artificial intelligence. But when we talk about the internet at large, it's not embodied, right? It's just artificial intelligence. It's everywhere. It's connecting everything, all the kinds of interfaces, like uh, in, in the very nice visualization that Rana did, uh, Safwan is saying, honestly, looking at how creepy AI bots can be, why consider replicating or producing more of them? Also remembering 30 third party users who exploit data like Cambridge Analytica. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Safwan, this is a very, very interesting uh, question. And I think that we don't have the answers to that because from one side, um, from one side, it's unstoppable, right? So it's not, a, I mean, we can't stop this. It's just happening. It's everywhere. And as designers, uh, we, we are forced to, to face this reality, right? Now, the more we understand the technologies, the better we're going to be able to, to fix the problem. That's how uh, I see uh, I think that us being together right now talking about these issues is a very good thing. It's the, it's the, it's the first step, right? Because if you don't uh, realize what's happening, then how can you even begin to, to, to uh, assess and, and do something about the situation, right? So I think the first step is doing what we're doing now, right? Is to have this kind of discussion, is to test and like my students did like many of them just you know they're not comfortable like Rafif did and I'm not comfortable giving me a lot of information I'm just going to give a little bit and see what happens because if we don't how how are we going to assess how are we going to understand we don't really have a lot of uh, we don't really have a lot of uh, uh, options to 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 probe those technologies. We even have to change the regulations uh, as well before we, we, we can make informed decisions. And, and never in the history of humanity, I don't think we, we needed so much to truly understand uh, the, the implications of this kind of technologies as we do now. So thank you for your question. Any other questions? Okay, so I guess this is it. I think so. I think that um, that was a very nice discussion. Thank you so much for participating today and coming. Thank you especially to my students. And I just don't have anything else to say. Just thank you. And uh, if you have any, any other questions, please, uh, you can always uh, send me an email to my GIGI uh, email, which is, I'm going to write here in the chat. So if you have any other questions, you can always get in touch. Okay.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you, Noor. Thank you, Rafif. And have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Ria.